My name is Nathan. I'm one of the pastors here. I'm so happy to be here with you this morning. I just wanted to say welcome to the Grove. If you're new here, we're so glad that you're joining us for this Christmas season. If you're watching online, we just wanted to say welcome. And we are in our Christmas series, and it's titled You Belong Here. And we're talking about pieces of the Christmas story. And today we're going to be talking about that, the piece of joy, joy being a, a piece of that Christmas story. And as I was thinking about joy, I, I thought the perfect title for this message would be interrupted by joy. And if you think about our life in our human experience, joy is something that, like, it hurts my heart to say this, but it's not a, a consistent theme of our experience, right? It's almost as if we're interrupted by joy. Have you ever run into someone and you just think to yourself, you are way too happy? Why? What's your secret? What do you have that I don't? A lot of us feel that way. And when we run into someone like that, it's almost as if our reality is interrupted by joy. And I'm reminded of maybe how it might be lacking in my life. And I was thinking about all the ways that I'm interrupted by joy throughout my, my week and my days. And I want you to, to process with me, who are some of the most joyful people that you've encountered in your life? Maybe on a daily basis. My, my husband, right? My, my, my wife, yeah, that's a church answer for sure. You know, for me, w one of the most joyful people I've ever met, it was, uh, well, all of them, the Costco samplers, <clears throat> for real. Ever since I was a teenager, that became my favorite place quickly. And they are so excited to give you a sample. And um, there's one lady in particular, she used to always be at the Santan Costco, and I haven't seen her there recently, but for years, she, uh, she would always see me and she was always so fired up and she was at the Zip Fizz booth. You know the Zip Fizz? that uh, fizzy energy drink that you pop open and pour it in your water bottle. And she's always shaking one up for me. She's like, hey, I've got your favorite flavor, the orange, orange cream, tastes like a 50-50 bar. And every time I would come to Costco, she would always have a water bottle full of zip fizz for me. And I uh, started to talk and she started to like drop like uh, Bible hints and Bible trivia on me. And she's like, hey, did you know? And I was like, ah, that explains it. That's why you're so full of joy. You're a, you're a believer. And believers are supposed to be marked and characterized by joy, right? Who else are some of the most joyful people that you've encountered in your life? For me, uh, kindergarten teachers. Yeah. I was a substitute teacher before I became a pastor, and I tell you what right now, I'm so glad I'm a pastor and not a kindergarten teacher. <laughs> Praise to you, elementary school teachers. I would sub kindergarten in first grade, and when I would come home, I would fall asleep instantly because I was so drained. It takes a special person to teach elementary school, and you are full of joy, seriously, yes. Thank God for you. Um, what is the opposite of joy? Sadness? That's what I thought at first too, but I was, I was thinking about this and it, it took me a little deeper. I feel like bitterness is the opposite of joy, right? Have you ever encountered bitterness out in public? Who are some of the most bitter, bitter people that you've encountered? They, I, it's called the DMV where I'm from, right? I'm like, hey, if you hate your job that much, you seriously just need to quit, right? That's not an enjoyable experience for any of us. You're just making this a, a whole lot worse. Um, who else, right? Well, uh, network marketers and telemarketers are the most joyful people until you tell them no, right? And then they're the most bitter people. Um, or a server. A server can go one of two ways. A server can be the most joy-filled person you ever encounter, and it's an amazing experience, or they can be so bitter, and you're like, what are you doing? Like, why didn't you call off sick? I know it's, you're not sick, but you might as well be. Um, I can think back a couple months, I was visiting my brother, and we were going out for our favorite dessert, this bread pudding in New Orleans, and we go to this restaurant just for the dessert. And we walked in, and, and he's like, hey, can I get you guys some drinks? And my brother's like, oh, hey, man, like, we literally just came for the dessert. And you see the server's face just go, oh, all right, well, which one is it? And we're like, the bread pudding, dude. Like, we're fired up. We're more fired up than him. He's like, oh, okay. And he takes our napkins and silverware away. He's like, all right, man, we'll have that right out. Someone else brings the bread pudding. We don't have silverware. Our server never comes back to check on us. And then when he does, he's just so bitter. And so I told my brother, I was like, you know what he gets? A $0 tip. I, I was ready to tip this man huge because all we did was come in and order dessert, but he was so bitter. And you know how they, they have the kiosk where they bring it to you and you swipe your card in front of them now. And I was like, I felt this rush of shame come over me. And I was like, oh no, I can't tip him $0. And I thought, yes, I can. And he looked right at it and I looked right at it and I clicked zero, zero, zero. And I was like, hey dude, maybe you should have a little bit more. I didn't say that. <laughs> I didn't say that. I thought, wow, some Christian I am, honestly. 
Have some grace for your pastor, right? But we see that for a lot of us, our human experience isn't characterized by joy. It's not. And even I was reading this week, psychologists said that joy is so lacking in our life that you know what we do? This is what a group of psychologists say. They've been studying human behavior. That we procrastinate going to bed because we're not, ex- we're not excited about the next day. We're not. Our, the, the next day is full of dread for us. It's not full of joy. And so what we do is we'll scroll on our phone or we'll play video games or we'll pour a drink to fall asleep in front of the TV. And really that's not because you're tired and you had such a long day. It's because you're lacking joy and excitement in your life and you're dreading the next day. So even when we go to bed, like I'm guilty of this, I'll bring my phone to bed and I'll sit there and scroll on my phone. And it's not because I have FOMO and I'm trying to catch up on what I might be missing out on. It's because I'm not excited about tomorrow and I'm actually procrastinating going to bed. And I was just like, that is a sad reality that needs to change, especially in the life of us as believers, amen? Amen. And not just the Christmas story, but we as Christ followers, our life should be characterized by joy. And joy is, it seems like an interruption. And I want joy to lead us further than just being an interruption, and we'll get there in the message, but today I want us to be interrupted by joy. That's what I want. And so we're going to look to the scriptures in Luke chapter 2, verse 8. If you have your Bible, you can turn there, Luke chapter 2, verse 8. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at the seemingly most insignificant people in the world with one of the worst jobs that you could ever imagine, who were looked down upon and disrespected probably more than any other person in their society, but they were entrusted with the greatest message ever to be told. And this message of good news brought great joy and it showed them their worth. It reminded them of their purpose and it caused great joy to be a main theme and characteristic in their life. And I wanna show everybody today how we can be interrupted by joy this Christmas season, how that same message can affect us in that same way today. So Luke chapter two, verse eight, we're gonna look at the lives of the shepherds this morning. It says, and there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. And this is how you know it's true. This will be a sign to you. You'll find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them, the shepherds, and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, they said, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they couldn't contain their joy and excitement. They spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen which were just as they had been told. And now the first question I wanna ask is, why shepherds? Why shepherds? First and foremost, no one today and no one in the first century even woke up and said, when I grow up, I wanna be a shepherd. Nobody said that ever. As a matter of fact, it was a job that was required of you as being the youngest in the family. And if you can recall David, who was the youngest of all of his siblings, was a shepherd. So it's not something you ever looked forward to, but it's something that you knew you had to do if you were the youngest. Everybody kind of had to pay their dues. And so being a shepherd is not something that was respected or something that you looked forward to, but here's what's unique about the shepherds. And this is the first thing that I wanna talk about in order for us to to, to find joy this Christmas season is the shepherds were faithful to what God had called them to. 
the shepherds were faithful to what God had called them to. Even if it was something that they didn't want to be doing in that present moment, they were faithful to what God had called them to. When the angel showed up to these shepherds, what were they doing? They were busy shepherding. They would watch over the flocks at night to protect them from threats, from intruders. And I think that is so cool that when God showed up to them, they were being faithful to what it is that God had called them to at that time. And here's something that I wanted to tell you. We need to take what we're working on seriously because what we're working on is actually working on us. And I'm gonna unpack that further in just a moment. But whatever it is that God has called you to in this present moment, it matters because that is actually working on you as well. And if we're not careful, we can grow discontent with our present reality because we may not like what God has called us to in this present moment. And you've heard this before. We get so busy, caught up in the future, and they say if you spend too much time in the future, you could actually bring anxiety into the present, right? Or you can be so caught up in the past. And we, what we do is we romanticize the past. It doesn't matter how bad the past was. We as human beings look back and go, oh, if it was just like, like the good old days, right? The good old days actually weren't that good, but we were so caught up romanticizing the past and we're never actually fully in the present. We're not. And so then we grow discontent and we lack joy in the present and it's because we're not being faithful to whatever it is that God has called us to in this present moment. And what happens is, I think for a lot of us, if we're doing something or God has called us to something that we might not be enjoying in this present moment, or maybe it got boring for us, or maybe we're tired of it and it feels mundane, a lot of us will tie our, our worth to what it is that we're doing. And we're connecting our worth as a human being to things like our net worth, our career, our performance, whatever it is, you name it. And we fail to miss the fact that God cares more about who we are and who we're becoming more so than what we're doing. But what we're doing is important because what we're doing is actually working on who we are. Amen? Always. It always is. It always is. No matter how trivial it might feel. It always is. And the shepherds, they had to be the most looked down upon people in society. And sure, their job was needed for food, for things like food and for clothing and even for animal sacrifice, which was a huge deal in this time period and in this context and in this culture. But you know what was even more important than those things? It's what the shepherds were learning in the process of shepherding. They were learning things like hard work, commitment, how to protect and care for those who couldn't protect and care for themselves. They were learning humility. That's what they were learning. They were becoming the people that God had in mind to entrust his message to. The type of people who could actually receive the gospel message. They weren't caught up in a power struggle like the religious leaders were, right? I often wonder, well, why didn't God come to the people who he was supposed to come to, the religious leaders? Because the religious leaders were caught up in a power struggle and they would have probably manipulated the gospel message for their own selfish gain. Not the shepherds. The shepherds weren't caught up in a power struggle. They weren't trying to keep up with the Joneses. They weren't covered in nice jewelry and Rolexes where most people think real joy is found. You know what the shepherds were covered in? They were covered in sh sheep. Ah, uh, yeah, you could, you're like, hey, sir, you're in church. They were covered in sheep. And someone told me a lot wiser than me, they said, every good shepherd smells like his sheep. Amen? The shepherds were humble. They were lowly. They were covered in sheep. They smelled like their sheep. They were faithful to what God had called them to. And they had a heart that was ready to receive the message that God had for them. So after we learn this about the shepherds, I also want to look at this passage and see that something else that's important after they've been faithful to what God has called them to, they weren't so busy to, to with doing what God had called them to do that they couldn't welcome an interruption. So what they did next is they welcomed interruptions. Do you like interruptions in your life? No, right? If I'm in the zone and I'm busy working and someone tries to interrupt me, it makes me bitter. I lack joy. I'm like, hey, can you come back another time? Can we have this conversation another time? I am busy. I'm not someone that naturally welcomes interruptions in my life. And I wanted to tell you, have you ever heard of a divine appointment? Have you heard of a divine appointment before? Have you ever experienced a divine appointment? 
It's that moment where you just, you look back and you're like, God showed up in that moment. You can't make this stuff up, right? It's like, clearly God was at work in my life in this moment, in this relationship, in whatever it was that happened. That's a divine appointment. And I'm convinced that divine appointments happen through divine interruptions. And so if we're so busy that we can't welcome interruptions, I am hard pressed to say that we might not experience God at work in our lives because oftentimes a divine appointment will come through a divine interruption. We need to welcome interruptions. In Luke chapter two, verse 10, it says, the angel said to them, don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. These shepherds found themselves being faithful to what God had called them to, but they weren't so busy that they didn't have time for an interruption. When's the last time that you welcomed an interruption in your life? Where you're like, hey, maybe God is trying to speak to me through this interruption. I was talking to a guy this week. Again, I love when you say you can't make this stuff up because it's a divine appointment. I was talking to a guy in the coffee shop this week and I was prepping my message and I had, I had the title, I, was, I felt good about the title, Interrupted by Joy. And I was processing how we as human beings, we don't welcome interruptions in our life. And in the coffee shop, I, I love how people are like, hey, you getting ready, you getting ready, man, your life's about to change. And I'm like, yes, it is. I'm as ready as I can be, but I'm not fully ready. I don't think I ever will be. We're talking about having a kid. And uh, yeah, I'm so excited. And he said, I, I, I have friends whose kids have grown up and I'm, I'm watching my friends around me and I'm just overwhelmed by how fast it seems to go. And I ran into someone in the coffee shop and, and I was telling him that. I'm like, man, it just seems like it goes so fast. And he said, it does. And he said, no matter how aware you are, it continues to go fast. And he said, my oldest is 18 and she's in her first year of college. And he starts to tell me this story. He says, when she was seven years old, I can remember I was busy working with a tech company and I was working these crazy hours because all of our clients were overseas. And he said, my hours, my, my prime time hours were 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. And he said, I had my headset on, this is before Zoom and we're on a conference call and I'm working away and I'm working away. And he said, one night I hear this knock on the door and I hear this knock and I'm like, what is going on? Is that coming through the headset? And he continues working, he hears the knock again and then he sees the door creep open and he sees his seven-year-old daughter walk in and she says, I'm sorry, daddy, I don't wanna interrupt you, but I have dinner and I didn't want you to miss dinner. And he said in that moment that he was like, wow, something has to change. Something has to change. And he said, I didn't quit my job right then and there, even though I wanted to, right? But he said, a couple months later, I found a new job and I protected my evenings with my family because I knew that those days and those years would go fast. And he said, and they still did. And now she's off to college. And I said, man, I'm preaching about welcoming interruptions this week in our life and how oftentimes we can miss what God is trying to do if we're so busy and caught up with what we think he's called us to, right? We have to be people that welcome interruptions in our life. We have to. Because interruptions can often show us what matters most if we let them, if we let them. Here's the third thing that the shepherds did is they let the good news cause great joy in their life, in their life. And this is the, this is the third thing that, that we need to do, right? We need to be faithful to what God has called us to. We need to welcome interruptions, but then we need to let the good news cause great joy. And so I go back to the shepherds and I'm, I'm processing shepherds, really. Everybody in the first century, especially the re religious leaders, they would have said, yeah, right. God's not speaking to the shepherds, are you kidding me? And everybody was waiting for the fulfillment of the prophecy of the Messiah to come. Everybody memorized the first five books of the Bible. They knew the Torah, they knew God's law. They all were hopeful and expectant of a Messiah, of a savior. All of our human hearts long for a savior. No one would have believed that the shepherds would be the people entrusted with the gospel message, let alone being welcomed into God's presence at the birth of Jesus. And this is how the good news causes great joy. Have you ever felt looked down upon? Have you ever felt disrespected? Have you felt like your life is just covered in sheep, right? You feel like you've been making so many mistakes, you're a moral failure, 
How could God love me and want me in his presence, let alone accept me with the most important message that humankind could ever hear? Have you ever felt that way? I'm sure the shepherds felt the same way. And this is the good news that causes great joy. For everybody here today, for everybody here today that's trying to be the perfect mom or the perfect dad or the perfect husband or the perfect wife. And so because we're trying to be perfect, we actually feel like a failure. I wanna tell you that you don't have to be. That's the good news that causes great joy. For anybody that's trying to be the perfect savior and that is trying to have this morally perfect track record so that you can feel worth it enough, I wanna tell you that you don't have to be. For anybody in this room that feels like you need to be a great leader in your family, in your home, in the workplace, and you wanna be a good shepherd, you wanna lead your people well, I wanna tell you there's only one good shepherd and his name is Jesus so that you don't have to be so that you don't have to be. It's funny, I was reading this story and I was like thinking about myself as being a shepherd and I'm like, hold up, we're not, we're not the shepherd. You know who we are? We're the sheep, right? In Isaiah chapter 53, verse six, it says, we all like sheep have gone astray. Every single one of us has gone our own way. And the Lord has laid on him, on Jesus, on the perfect sacrifice, the iniquity of us all. And you know what that means? It means 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, that God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And God doesn't wait for us to clean our lives up or get our act together, right? In Romans chapter 5, verse 8, it says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were off wandering and going astray, while we were still sinners, Christ Jesus died for us. And that's the good news that causes great joy. That we don't have to spend the rest of our lives trying to be the perfect sacrifice. We already have one. That we don't have to spend the rest of our lives trying to be the good shepherd. We already have one. We already have one. He's both the perfect lamb and the good shepherd so that we don't have to be. And that's the greatest news any one of us could ever receive. And this is my prayer for, for us today and for us for the rest of our lives as we leave this place. My prayer is that the gospel message would interrupt our life in this moment and that it would cause joy to be a main theme throughout our life, no matter what comes our way, no matter what it is that God has called us to, no matter how hard or difficult it might feel in this moment, you know that God is gonna work on you through all of it for his glory and for his goodness, no matter what. And this is my prayer that we would go from being interrupted by joy, maybe being aware of how much we lack it, being interrupted by the gospel message that causes great joy, and that we would go from being interrupted to interrupting the world around us and bringing joy to a world that so desperately needs it. Amen? Amen. And how do we do that? We're faithful to what it is that God has called us to, knowing that he is at work on us and within us, and that he's created us to do good works. And we need to welcome the interruptions in our life, not allow those interruptions to make us bitter and angry. We need to welcome the interruptions. We need to step back and say, God, how are you trying to reach me through this interruption? And then after that, we need to continue to come back to the good news that causes great joy for all who hear it, believe it, receive it. And then our only natural response after that is to share it.